Okay. I can see the streaming, so it's going live. Yeah, you can start now. I will go to the and to Zoom. Yes, Zoom. PowerPoint slides. Yeah. Shall we start? Yes. Okay. Good morning or good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the November monthly lecture of the Varaha Mahira Science Forum. Our programs are available on our website. Uh, videos of past lectures are also available on both YouTube and our website. And this is our the HTML for our website, varahamahirasf.blogspot.com. You go there, you see the snapshots and the videos of all our talks uh, in the last three and a half years. I'll briefly introduce, uh, give an introduction for those of you who are new to what this forum is. Then I will introduce the speaker, after which uh, Kathy will take over and give this month's lecture at the end of which you can have a Q&A session. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Varaha Mahira Science Forum. Uh, if you are not from India, this is the first time you're watching a program. Varaha Mahira was a sixth century astronomer who wrote a book called the Pancha Siddhantika, which is a comparative text of five astronomical texts at that time. Pancha is five, Siddhanta is uh, treatise, so it is a comparison of five treatises. So we named, we named our forum after them, after him. We are also uh, have an active WhatsApp group. Uh, this is the India numbers for three of its uh, three of our administrators. So if you want to join the WhatsApp group, you can just uh, note it down, message us, and we'll add you. We have a discussion forum. We call it All Things Science, and then uh, we discuss science, but a bunch of other stuff also tends to creep in. And uh, this is the forum that we have. Uh, we started this in August 2017. Uh, Madras, our hometown, Chennai, as it's called, is some, considered by some to be the cultural capital of India for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, it's uh, declared a musical city uh, recently by the uh, UNESCO's Heritage Group. Uh, one of the things that is generally not recognized as culture is science. It's, you know, mostly it's art, music, literature, uh, dance, cinema, those are considered science. I mean, those are considered culture, but science too is part of our culture. And Madras has an important uh, role to play in the history of Indian science and science in general. But while we have lectures regularly in the city, they are usually in very specified technical institutions, colleges, universities, hospitals, conferences, and all that. There are very few popular lectures. There are quite a few popular lectures, but they are few and far between. Not everybody knows uh, when they happen. And they all find out the next day after it has happened. So we, we wanted a forum uh, to discuss these things. We wanted a forum to host a forum, uh, host a series of lectures, which is targeted not entirely at the technical uh, people. So we don't, we don't want to talk about medicine only to doctors. We don't want to talk about engineering only to engineers. We don't want to talk about, say, rocket science only to rocket scientists and so on. We wanted to uh, have lectures and uh, programs that are targeted at the general public, uh, not just scientifically literate public who are curious, but at the general public who tend to stop uh, you know, involving themselves with science after school. So that's kind of why we started the forum. This is the, not the first such attempt. There have been uh, things before. And one of the reasons we did this is, uh, I mean, building a community was one of the reasons we did this. So we, that's why we have WhatsApp group, Facebook page, YouTube channel. Uh, there's no organization to join, you just, you know, join the WhatsApp group, comment on our Facebook page, and we'll respond and so on. We are not interested purely in just the facts. And in fact, today's lecture will kind of cover that aspect of it, the historical perspective, the story of the characters involved. Uh, too much science is presented very dryly with none of the failures, the human aspects of the people involved. And we kind of wanted to you know, bring those things in. So for our presentation, we are not only looking at professionals, but amateurs too. And we care as much about uh, style as substance. Um, and Kathy has one of the best presentation styles I've seen, which is why uh, uh, we invited her to uh, give us this lecture. 
there's also a non profit attempt uh, so sponsors hosts any volunteers are more than welcome this is our youtube channel you can go look for it and you'll see all the videos of past lectures uh, we even had a few lectures in tamil most lectures tend to be in english a couple of uh, two or three lectures but they were not that popular i don't know why uh, perhaps because the majority of our lectures are in english uh, some of the local audience tends to not uh, attend them we hope to change that we'll have a, uh, uh, we also are willing to have uh, deliver lectures at other forums like schools colleges and so on and we'll some day we've been promising this for uh, uh, over a year now activities and heritage walks but corona lockdown really kind of put wait to that at least for now probably next year like we said there have been other such organizations before there was a bertrand russell society in the 1960s uh, at iit the major engineering college here we've had guest lectures by arvind gupta fields medalist manjul bhargava gave a lecture at the ksra sanskrit college india's first astronaut rakesh sharma gave a lecture um there was a baskaracharya workshop baskaracharya is a 12th century mathematician there was a workshop about him by the kv sharma foundation uh, krishnasamy alladi who has spoken at our forum gave a lecture at his uh, was on the mathematician ramanujam cnr rao one of the india's uh, major scientists who got the bharat ratna a few years back gave lectures uh, mat science institute of mathematical sciences has uh, recently held a series of lectures every february at the music academy uh, the Bl local planetarium birla planetarium uh, opened up they they have a astronomy night every every second saturday or something like that they open not, not during the lockdown but generally uh they uh, had a venus transit uh, you know stereoscope set up for venus transit they had one for uh, um mercury transit also and uh, as i like to proudly say uh, madras is one of the few cities from which you can watch a rocket launch right from your rooftop this literally is my rooftop this is a trail of one of the psl the polar satellite launch vehicle rockets taken a couple of years back this one is from uh, inside uh, the library anna center in library you know taken they are taken 3 months apart really i think so um, you know how many towns how many places can you say you can see you know rocket launch from the rooftop not many so um we vara mera science forum besides lectures have also of late uh, offered courses we've had you know we had three or four courses this this year uh, especially during the lockdown uh, via zoom uh, i gave a series of lectures on indian mathematics and astronomy uh three four batches we have done that uh badri one of the other hosts uh, gave a lecture on kuttaka the mathematics of aryabhatta and later mathematicians on this is basically linear indeterminate equations which are unfortunately not covered in most math programs either in school or in college and then he followed it up with a workshop on bhavana and chakravala which are quadratic you know methods and uh, solutions to quadratic indeterminate indeterminate equations by brahmagupta and baskara and we'll probably offer these courses again in the near future uh, we have had a few among several lectures that we had we have had lectures on physics chemistry biology geology architecture uh, you know history and several individuals and so on um, some of the, i'll go through some of the physics lectures because they are perhaps relevant to this talk we had siddharth talk about isaac newton the force awak awakens this is uh, a brief introduction to newton's famous book uh, the philosophia naturalis principia mathematica in which he explains gravity and the laws of motion that was 3 uh, years back then we had akash narayan who wrote, right now works in the fermi lab at uh, in, in illinois he gave a lecture on atomic theory and he tried to make it friendly atomic so he called it atomic theory for alan elu party and we had uh, i gave a lecture on the astronomy and mathematics of ancient cultures this was in tamil um dr satish kumar saravan saravan and then a scholar at the leibniz university was visiting madras and he gave a lecture on a brief history of gravity he is working on the gravity of uh, black holes supermassive black holes he is now moved to brazil and he is doing research there uh, we had akash again come come back to india for a visit and he gave a lecture on the story of light and most recently last november uh, the 100th anniversary of uh, cv raman we had a lecture by dr srinivas rao on the life and works of cv raman cv raman was the first indian scientist to get a nobel prize for discovering the raman effect and so those are some of the lectures we had one program by students and teachers of uh, sevalaya school where they you know used to sundial professor swaminathan one of our uh, mentors and well wishers uh, you know helped them uh, dr mr narayan designed the and made the sundial the, the teachers were trained by professor swaminathan they went on to you know teach the students and so on and so we cover a variety of topics we've had one, 
102 meteorology there is one of the monsoon also this is about weather and climate in sangam poetry which is uh, tamil poetry from 2000 years back we had arvind gupta uh, a iit former iit professor gave a wonderful lecture on science through toys we had dr utra dorayrajan talk about leelavathi's daughters the women scientists of india we had a geologist dr singaranjan give a lot lecture about uh, wandering rivers and cruise in coast lines and how some geological changes have happened in living memory and so this is a variety of the topic i am not going through all of them just give a, a quick overview of it and so today we come to uh, today's speaker kathy kathy joseph i came to, i stumbled upon her on youtube uh, she has a wonderful channel it's called kathy loves physics she has a whole series on electricity which is where uh, i discovered her i stumbled upon her talk about edison and tesla and all the myths surrounding tesla and edison uh, that was delightful and i found out it is a part of a very very long series of uh, you know very short videos 10 minute videos full of delightful you know interesting fascinating things about history that i didn't know people like didn't know contributions i had never heard of uh, all very exciting stuff and so we come and we contacted her and asked her if she would give us a talk she said yes and then you know that was just last month so we so we are very delighted she is a mother and a teacher um, i think she she mentions in her she runs a uh, she has a facebook page also she mentions in her uh, page that uh, she wanted to do research but she find uh, you know physics science research but she finds this much more uh, fun and she's more uh, you know I, at the end of the lecture i think you'll agree Uh, so without much further ado uh, i'd like to uh, invite kathy to give a talk thank you great thank you so much let's see if i can figure out how to turn on the talk it's always ironic when i can't figure out the technology okay let's see share screen there we go yep okay there we go sorry da -da -da. So my talk today is on why science needs historical context, and I'm calling it a science journey. Don't worry, that's the only whiz bang transition. And when I started studying the history of science, I just started studying it because I loved it, but I was surprised at how profound it was, how it changed my understanding of the science and of the history. And as people usually say, show don't tell. So instead of telling you how important I think context is, I'm going to give a lecture on a context of a story, and then you can decide if you think historical context is important. And my talk is gonna have three parts. First, I'm gonna talk about how we realize there's a force between electricity and magnetism, which is usually attributed to a Danish man named Orsted. Then I'm gonna talk about how that led to understanding that light was an electromagnetic wave. So if you've watched the previous talk, which I didn't know about, might be some overlap there, but that should be good. And then finally, I'm gonna do some repercussions, which are surprising. Radio, radar, microwave, computers, you'll see, it gets pretty far ranging. Okay, so first I'd like to start with what I was taught in school, which was something like this. In 1820, Danish scientist Hans Orsted accidentally discovered that the current carrying wires create circular magnetic fields. I don't know if the rest of you learned it that way, but it was pretty common and that's how I taught it too. And if you pause and think about it for a second, think about what word sticks out for you. It's probably the word accidentally, because all of us have had an accident and we could imagine that stubbing our toe led to something good, whereas none of the other words have any real context or meaning to us. And ironically, accidentally is one of the words that is not correct because Hans Christian Orsted was looking for connection between electricity and magnetism for 14 years because he was more of a philosopher Then he was a physicist and his philosophy believed that he wanted to quote, prove from empirical science how the laws of nature form a rational whole and how nature itself is a revelation of reason. So because he thought nature revealed reason, he wanted to connect different subjects together. And by the way, as a side note, he also didn't discover that the magnetic fields were circular. He thought they were spiral. 
Okay, so let me go into a little background. Why did he think that electricity and magnetism were linked? Well, what, and let me rephrase. Why didn't people know beforehand that electricity and magnetism were linked? That was actually 200 years before Orsted. There was an Elizabethan doctor named William Gilbert, and he liked to study magnets because he believed that if he got better magnets, he'd get better compasses and he would help his country take over the world. So he had this theory that, that at the time they had this theory, the compasses always pointed north because they pointed to the North Star. And he had a theory that we believe is true today that the earth is a giant magnet. And he made a magnet out of a load that was circular and did experiments with it and validated his theory that the earth is magnetic. And because of that theory, oh, he, and he wrote a book called Magnetism or Of Magnets. And because of that theory, he named the poles of a magnet, the North Pole, as it pointed to geographic north and the South Pole as it pointed to geographic south. But anyway, while he was studying this, he wondered if magnetic forces were the same as static electricity. He knew that magnets attracted metal from a distance, and he knew that items such as amber jewelry, if you rub it on fur, can attract feathers and fur. So he wondered if they were the same thing or linked. But then he studied it. He actually used the scientific method, which is amazing because he predated the scientific method. But he found out, he's like, magnets are permanent, static electricity is impermanent, you need to rub it. Magnets work underwater, static electricity doesn't work underwater in humid days. Magnets only attract certain metal, static electricity attracts all light objects. And very few objects are magnets, and when he studied it, he found tons of objects when he rubbed it would create static electricity. So since he figured out they were different things, and since he knew about static electricity from amber, he decided to name static electricity after amber. So this is a painting of him describing it to Queen Elizabeth. And the Greek name for amber is electron. So he named it the electrius force or the electric force. So then for many, many years, they were completely separate items. Now I'm going to fast forward to the 1700s. In 1732, a woman named Laura Bossi in Italy was, given, was known as a brilliant person and was given her PhD as a publicity stunt to track people to her town. You know, come see the thinking woman. And then um, a few years later, she got the first static electricity machine in all of Bologna. But she wasn't allowed to teach in the university because she was a woman. And so she wanted to teach in her home and they didn't want her to do that either. So then she got married and taught in her home. And when she taught in her home, she got to teach all of the unusual things and all of the latest things, including the ideas from Ben Franklin. So she set up an outdoor and indoor electricity lab. The indoor electricity lab, they tended to electrify animals to try to figure out how that worked. And the outdoor ones, they did experiments with putting up large um, spiked metal objects to attract electricity on stormy days. In the late 1750s, she taught a biology student named Luigi Galvani, and he'll come back. And then in 1776, she became the first modern female professor when Luigi's father-in-law died. Then tragically, less than two years later, she also died from a heart attack. And that was sort of the end of her story. And it was especially tragic because she died just a few years before her student, Luigi Galvani, discovered something amazing. In about 1784, Lucia and Luigi Galvani were trying to publish their work on the hearing of various animals, and someone stole their work. And so they had to find a new subject and fast. And so they thought back to Laura Bossi's teaching and bought, a whole, uh, bought an electricity generator and then one day, one of their assistants was playing with the electricity, and one of them put a dead dissected frog on the table. And then when they touched the frog, 
the frog jumped. And this was the first time they could see that electricity could move a dead object as well, in a, as, well as a living object. And they were excited as heck. They, oh, they electrified every object they could find, every animal they could find. And they found the frog's leg worked the best because their leg muscles are so strong. And then in part of their studies, he took his um, frog legs outside to see if they would jump in the storm. And one day he noticed they jumped on a calm day. And he was completely confused. Why is this frog jumping outside? And he realized it wasn't the weather. It was the two pieces of metal. He had one piece of metal holding up the frog and one piece of metal on the gate. And he realized that two different metals create an electric force on the frog. And he called that animal electricity. They called it animal electricity. And there's a picture of zinc and copper. Now, I like to redo the simple experiments, but I just couldn't kill a frog. It's just not my thing. But some lovely people in France at the University de Rennes, I think I'm saying that right, um, did this experiment and let me use it. So I'd like to show it to you. It's very short. So you can see the frog jumping. Ready? Oh, I'm going to show it again because it's so cool. So they had two different metals, and that's it. And the oh, frog jumps. Um, and so, of course, if this reminds you of Dr. Frankenstein, there's a reason. If you read the introduction to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, she talks about how you know you can bring animals back, to, uh, people back to life because of galvanism. So that was her thing. Now then we get to, oh, no, I don't need to show it one more time. There we go. A man named, a fellow Italian named Alessandro Volta. And Volta was very excited about this, but then he decided to try to put two different metals on the live frog and found the frog moved. I'm very proud of that little animation. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he decided that it had nothing to do with animal electricity. It just had to do with the power of the metals. So if he put two different metals in his mouth, he could feel a tingling. Just like if you bite on tinfoil and you have um, fillings in your mouth, you can feel the tingling. But if he put the two pieces of metal on the table and connected it with wires of the same material, no tingle. So eventually he thought, well, maybe they need to be wet. So what eventually he did is he piled up the different metals with salt water soaked paper between them, not knowing that the salt water acted like an acid, which is what was needed to make the battery. And then he invented the battery. And you can, in fact, light up a little LED light bulb with a pen and washer. And I use vinegar because it's a little bit more powerful. And um, this is, by the way, the French, the Italians, think of uh, Spanish. They use the word battery and they use the word pile. And they use the word pile because the original battery was a pile. I don't think the English ever use the word pile. <laughs> okay, so that brings us back to Orsted. Orsted was like, okay, the battery has a plus and minus, the magnet has a north and south, the battery continually operates, the magnets continually operate. Maybe it isn't the connection between static electricity and magnets. Maybe it's connection between a battery and magnet. So that's what he was doing all those years. He trying to use a magnet to move a battery and a battery to move a compass, which is just a little magnet on a pivot and nothing, a whole world of nothing. And then in April of 1820, he he had a battery and this was just two different metals in the bucket of acid and it moved a compass now the story is usually told that he was teaching class and he saw the compass twitch but i haven't seen anything from him or any of his contemporaries that say this all he said was he noticed it and then wanted to wait a few months because it was so important and to do it again with a friend of his who had a better battery. So I, my guess is that it became known as accidental discovery because he said he had to wait a few months and then people were like, huh, how do you accidentally discover it? I'm sure it was in the class and he did it like that. 
that's just my theory. It's possible he did see in the class, but he was definitely on the lookout for connection between these two things. Anyway, it turned out that it wasn't that the magnet was connected to the battery. The magnet was attracted, well, was moved by current in a wire, by electricity moving. And the battery made the electricity move. And the weird thing, oh, I'm gonna, there it is. Um, I guess I can go back, sorry. The weird thing is the magnet doesn't point towards the wire or away from the wire or even with the wire. It points in a circle around the wire. It's almost like, then this is what this image is. It's almost like you can imagine Gandalf or a wizard putting their um, thing down and having the thing go move around in a circle. It is one of the strangest forces in existence. Every other force is a push or pull, gravity, magnets, um, electrostatics, all of, even your, you know, getting in a physical fight. It's all push or pull. This is a very strange force. The current goes down the wire, the magnetic field goes in a circle around it. It is so strange that Orsted said, no, I don't like it, it shouldn't be like that. So what Orsted thought was, there was a positive current spiraling around one way that was sort of dragging the north side of the magnet with it. There was a negative current spiraling the other way, dragging the south part of the magnet. All of that was very complicated. But even so, the whole world was enthralled with this idea that there was finally connection after 220 years between electricity and magnets as long as the electricity was moving. And that brings us back to England and a young man named Michael Faraday who read about this and did all the experiments he could to try to find a spiral and he couldn't. It was always going in a circle. And he thought, I have to prove this some way. And the way I wanna prove it is he's like, if I had a magnet that was free to move, it should move in a circle around a current carrying wire. And if I have, a current carrying wire that's free to move, it should move in a circle around a permanent magnet. So this experiment I did redo because it didn't involve dead frogs. And um, I just copied the part. So um, I mentioned, he mentions it to someone. He'd just gotten married and he brought his teenage uh, brother-in-law to do this experiment. And what the experiment was, was he had a wire that was free to move and a permanent magnet and this stuff in here, he used mercury. I use salt water because mercury is poisonous, but mercury is also conductive, which means the electricity can flow in there into the other part of the circuit. And he was trying to prove that the force was circular. Had a wire drop down on a cup full of mercury. Mercury is conducting fluid with a permanent bar magnet in the center. When he closed the switch, the wire spun continuously. Supposedly, Faraday shouted, there they go, there they go, we have succeeded at last. So this was the first electric motor as well, but it was completely useless. Like, unless you want an electric motor to stir your mercury, there's no point to this. But because he wasn't making it to be practical, he was making it to prove a theoretical point, that the magnetic field, which hadn't been named yet, was circular. There we go. So that's the first part. That's how they got the relationship between electricity and magnetism. But that led directly to understanding that light is an electromagnetic wave. So let me go into that. So after Faraday published his discovery of the magnetic fields around the current carrying wire, his boss got really mad at him, his advisor, because he didn't mention his advisor. And his advisor felt that that was um, a man named Humphrey Davy, who was the world's most famous scientist at the time, arguably. <laughs> I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Anyway, so um, Faraday was sidetracked. And the only job he could take as a young married man with no background and no connections and no math ability was a job making glass for telescopes for the British government, which he was miserably bad at, at least according to him although they paid for him for nine years, so he couldn't have been that bad. Meanwhile, 
a man in Germany named Georg Ohm used the compasses to find the relationship between current and voltage, otherwise known as V equals IR, which is why resistance is measured in ohms and the like. And in France, a man named André-Marie Ampere, as in current measured in amps, tried to spiral the current by making it into the wire into a spiral and found it acted like a weak magnet. A few years after that, an English um, retired soldier used, read that and decided to, it would be easier to just wrap the wire around a bar. And then he found it made a way stronger magnet. And they started calling it electromagnets because when you have current in the wire, this acts like a strong bar magnet. But if you remove the current, it stops acting like a magnet. And that's the definition of an electromagnet. So anyway, by um, 1830, Faraday quit his government job. He's like, I am going to do pure science, whether it works or not. This is it. And he was determined to use an electromagnet to find a way to make magnetism. Sorry, I should have written it the other way to use magnetism to make electricity. They could move a magnet with electricity, but they didn't know how to make electricity with a magnet. And he figured these strong electromagnets were stronger than the magnets they had around. Maybe he could use that to discover how to make electricity with a magnet. So what he had was he had this ring and you notice it looks sort of like a mummy's ring. That's because they didn't sell insulated wire at the time. So what he did is he took out linen and hand wrapped it in linen. That's why it looks like a mummy. And he wrapped it in two coils. This is actually his drawing of it. He, two coils that were separate. And he's like, maybe if I make one side into a magnet that's strong enough, I can make the other side have current. So what he did is he had a battery and he had on the other side what they called a galvometer, named after our friend the Galvanis, which was just actually a compass. That's all it was. And he found to his shock that the only time the galvometer moved was when the battery on the left was plugged in or unplugged. That was it. Other than that, no matter how strong the current was in part A, he didn't get any current in part B. So he realized it was the, just like it was the moving of electrons that moved the magnet, it was the changing of the magnetic field that created, or it's called induced current in the other side. So, and then once he did that, oh, discovered induction. And once he did that, he wrote a paper and he, he started to think about how to figure out which direction the current was going in. And if you've ever taken a basic physics class and you're trying to figure out which direction the current is induced in, and you do the right, uh, it's very complicated. And most of the time the students just go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and pick their favorite direction. <laughs> but he tried to describe it as the current was created when you break the lines of magnetic force. He called the magnetic field lines of magnetic force, which if you think about it, is a better name. And he said, okay, look, if you have a coil with, which is making, acting like an electromagnet, you can actually put it in another coil and it will create a bit of current as long as this one's moving or this one's moving or this one's getting electricity or removing electricity. All of those are creating a magnet and therefore breaking the lines of magnetic force. He eventually also found, and this is his actual device, because the people at the Royal Institute keep everything, which I adore. And um, this is when he finally got a strong bar magnet to create current in coils of wire. If he moved it really, really fast, he was sort of shaking it. And then finally, he found that he could create current if he had a bar magnet and he had a disc and he spun the disc. And actually, supposedly, the prime minister came to see him when he discovered this, because this was big, huge news, and asked him what the purpose of it was. And he said, I don't know, but whatever it is, I'm sure your government will tax it someday. 
And he was so right. Because one of the first things that came from this was an electric generator. Just a year after he discovered that moving a magnet near coils of wire, in 1832, the first generator was made. And all it did was spun a magnet near coils of wire. And by the 1880s, they spun electromagnets near coils of wire to create the current. But these things were powerful enough to light whole cities. And it all came from his discovery. There is another thing that happened, which is called an induction coil or spark generator. Spark generator is a much more logical thing. And it started with a reverend, Irish reverend named Nicholas Cullen in 1836, who figured out how to get the best shock he could possibly get, I'm very proud of that picture, um, out of coils. He found it worked better if the two coils were inside each other and the second coil was thinner. And once again, by the 1880s, they had some pretty professional systems that would make huge sparks that were way too strong to hold on to. I mentioned uh, the induction coil, especially because it's going to come back. Put a pin in that one. Okay. So now I'm going to fast forward a little bit to oh, 1845, not 1945. <laughs> Pardon me. Michael Faraday was like Orsted. He believed that everything was connected. And he once wrote, I have long held an opinion, almost amounting to a conviction, that the various forms under which the forces of matter are directly related and mutually dependent. And so for this reason, he'd already connected, um, he'd, he'd read about the connection between electricity and magnetism. He'd found a way to use magnets and create electricity. So those were definitely linked, but he wanted to link it to other things gravity and light. Now he got nowhere with gravity and he also got nowhere with light until 18, 1845. And in 1845, he went to a conference and met a young man named William Thompson. Now, William Thompson, by the way, if you never heard his name, it's because when he was older, he was knighted Lord Calvin, like the temperature scale. But this time he was a 19 year old wonder kid who brashly talked to one of the more uh, Michael Faraday and um, wrote him a letter afterwards and asked him if he had ever looked at light when it was going through a transparent material to see if he could change what's called the polarization of it when it's through a transparent material. And Faraday was really excited about this. I mean, like he wrote back immediately and said he was very excited about it and was going to try it in the laboratory. And this is what he did on September 13th, 1845. He took light from a lamp, reflected it at what's called Brewster's angle, which is at a sharp angle. Oops. Sorry. There we go. Sharp angle, so all the light is polarized horizontally. This is sort of like the glare off of um, looking at water where you wear polarized sunglasses. The polarized sunglasses work really well because they block this light and there isn't any other light from the glare. Then he had to go through what's called a nickel prism, which blocked the light that was horizontal. And then he took uh, an um, electromagnet, and one of the pieces of glass that he worked on for all those years that didn't work. <coughs> and when he turned on the electromagnet, he could see the light. And when he turned it off, he couldn't see the light. And he's like, ha ha. I have finally, finally found a connection. Ooh. Connection, for the first time, a true direct relation and dependence between light and the magnetic and electric forces. He was super excited about it. Everyone was super excited about it. Light is connected to electricity and magnetism. But how? Nobody knew. They just knew it was somehow connected. And he kept on thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it, but he hadn't really gotten to a good answer. But then on April 3rd, 1846, he was supposed to introduce a talk by a man named Charles Wheatstone. But Wheatstone chickened out. And he ran off and didn't refuse to give the talk. Supposedly, there was some critic there who was quite scary. So Faraday had to give a whole talk when he'd only prepared the introduction. And Faraday was a very organized man. Like, he had reams and reams of um, notebooks 
every paragraph was numbered for his entire life. I mean, uh, just the opposite of me. But uh, he had to give a speech where he only had five minutes. So after about 10 minutes of talking about Wheatstone, he had nothing else to say. So he decided to give what he called the matter for speculation, the vague impressions of my mind. And what was he thinking about? He was thinking about light. And he says, okay, imagine you have two charged particles or two magnets, and they're connected by their lines of force. If you vibrate one, it should make the other one vibrate. Maybe that's what light is. And he was very deferential. I mean, he was just like, these are the vague recollections of my mind. Maybe if we think about this more, we'll realize that it's garbage. He was not at all sure of himself. That, yeah, the view which I'm so bold to put forth considers therefore radiation, i.e. light, as a high species of vibration in the lines of force. This is 1846. Now, most people just ignored this one. They thought everything else was great, but lines of force, mm. And that brings us to eight years later and a young, handsome man named James Clerk Maxwell. And James Clerk Maxwell at this time was a 23-year-old grad student of math and physics, Cambridge. And he moved into his own place and he, quote, this is in his letters. He'd entered the unholy state of bachelorhood and had a wish to attack electricity. I think the unholy state of bachelorhood just means He's on his own, so maybe he should study something new. Um, and I forgot to say he was Scottish. So he asked his friend, William Thompson, same guy. And William Thompson said, you got to read Faraday. So he says, okay, I'll read Faraday. And he became devoted to putting Faraday's idea into mathematical terms. I don't know if I was clear before, but Faraday had like one week of education he couldn't even do algebra. He could not do any math. And Maxwell was a math prodigy. But when Maxwell read Faraday, he could just see the math inside of it in a way that basically no one else could. So um, in 1856, a few years later, he got a job at a college and he grew a bushy beard to look older, which I find tragic. <laughs> That's just the the woman in me. Um, and he also hated, I love this story. He hated that town and he wrote his friend, quote, no jokes of any kind are understood here. I have not made a joke for two months. And if I feel one coming on, I shall bite my tongue. But it wasn't all a loss because at the college, he met a woman named Catherine Dewar and she was the daughter of a history professor and they fell instantly and madly in love and married in 1859. And she was also a scientist, although we have no idea how much math skills she had, nor much of her contributions because their letters to them were burned in a fire later on. And most biographers tried to cut out her influence. But there was one letter from him where he said that my better half, meaning his wife, did all the real work of kinetic theory. So she must have contributed something. Anyway, um, Thompson, the same guy who called, uh, encouraged him to read uh, Faraday, told him to read an article by two Germans. See, back in 1856, two Germans named Weber and Karash, I don't know how to pronounce that, but I'm just going to go with Karash, experimentally found the ratio of units of electricity divided by the units of magnetism. Now, the, what made this exciting? is this ratio was approximately equal to the speed of light. So that implied that electricity and magnetism related to each other with the speed of light. And Maxwell wrote, quote, the velocity found in experiments such as Weber is so nearly that of light, it seemed we have strong reason to conclude that light itself is an electromagnetic disturbance in the form of waves. And by the way, when Maxwell started writing about this, he used the math term fields instead of the non-math term um, lines of force, which is why we are stuck with electric fields, magnetic fields, gravitational fields. That's all Maxwell's fault. If we hadn't had Maxwell, we might have stuck with the lines of force, which I still prefer. 
Anyway, in 1861 and in 1865, Maxwell wrote a whole series of equations, whoop, which are called Maxwell's equations, relating electricity and magnetism and light. And he said these papers are the same in substance as Faraday's, except that in 1846, there is no data to calculate the velocity of propagation. This is also, I gotta say, how strange Maxwell thought. Like Maxwell's paper is so different from Faraday's little paragraph, I might be so bold to say that light is the disturbance of this field. But to Maxwell, they were exactly the same. The only difference between his huge papers with 20 equations and more and Faraday's idea was that there was no data to calculate the speed. But from a modern point of view, they're completely different. But it's just how, Faraday, uh, how Maxwell thought. Anyway, unfortunately, tragically, in 1877, Maxwell fell ill. And he died in 1878 when he was only 48 years old. He's under 48 when this picture was taken. It's unbelievable to me. Um, but anyway, I, I really liked him and I'm still sad about his death. So now we move on. If you're wondering why Maxwell's equations don't look like what you might have studied in school, there's a guy with a very interesting haircut named Oliver Heaviside. He was an electrical engineer working in telegraphs and he bumped into Maxwell's papers at a library and he said, I saw it was great, greater and greatest with prodigious possibilities in its power. I was determined to master the book and set to work. And he did. And what he ended up doing was making a, let's see if I have it, ha <laughs> ha. He made it much simpler and turned it into four equations that still drive people crazy today. And if all these equations freak you out, don't worry about it. You don't have to deal with it until you get to grad school in physics. And if you decide not to do grad school, you probably don't have to deal with this. But these equations in the earlier form or the later form, took the science world by storm. It became a way of mathematically dealing with light and electricity and magnetism and linking everything together. And the group of people who believed in these equations were called the Maxwellians. And they were, they were almost like a secret club. They all, you know, promoted each other and promoted these ideas. And one of the, oh, okay, ah, almost there. So that was how it ended up with light. Now we wanna do the consequences of light being an electromagnetic wave from radio to computers. Okay, so one Maxwellian was a German scientist named Hermann von Helmholtz. And in 1879, he was in charge of a yearly prize. And as a Maxwellian, he said, okay, the prize goes to the person who experimentally proves the theory of electrodynamics, which is brought forth by Faraday and which was mathematically executed by Mr. Maxwell. And he tells his grad student, a guy named Heinrich Hertz, this is a good project for you. And Heinrich Hertz says, no thanks, too hard. This is too scary. And actually his, um, Hertz's diary was published by his wife after his death. And I just love this because this isn't edited. This is what he would say all day. Like May 13th, all he wrote was nothing but electromagnetics. July 8th, all he wrote was electromagnetics still without success. Did not feel like working. Depressed, could not get along with anything. Hard to work with Maxwellian electromagnetics in the evening. This is all he said. My favorite is at the end of 1885, he wrote, happy this year is over and hoping it will not be followed by another like it which I've definitely had years like that. And the next year wasn't like it. The next year was better because the next year he met a woman named Elizabeth Dahl and he showed her, her his laboratory. And when he was showing her his laboratory, they saw a spark in a coil, a distance from a discharging, it was called a Leyden jar, it was a capacitor. And he's like, he remembered his old advisor's assignment of proving experimentally the light was an electromagnetic wave. And he decided to go back to it. And by the next year he had, and what he did is he used that induction coil. I don't know if you remember that with the, um, the coil which made the big spark. All he did was add an antenna to it. 
And then he received it with a little circular antenna. This was way bigger than it was in real life. And he just saw a tiny little spark from there. And he did it in a room that was like six foot long. It was not a long distance radio wave. He discovered radio waves. And this is his actual receiver. It's a photo of his receiver. And he would see a little gap in there and he would make the gap bigger to see how strong the electric field was. And he wrote, I love this. The sparks are microscopically short, scarcely a hundredth of a millimeter long. They only last about a millionth of a second. It seems almost absurd and impossible that they should be visible. Upon this thin thread hung the success of our undertaking. But still with that, he managed to discover the waves. He managed to discover that they moved at the speed of light. And he had discovered a new kind of visible, invisible light. And someone asked him what the use of it. And he says, no, it's no use whatsoever. It's just an experiment that proves Maestro Maxwell was right. We have these mysterious electromagnetic waves we cannot see with the naked eye, but they're there. And it's true, even before Hertz, there's radio waves everywhere. We get radio waves from the atmosphere. Every time there's a spark, there's a little radio wave. It's just, we don't do anything with it. So anyway, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of death. Poor Hertz died of blood poisoning when he was only 36 years old on January 1st, 1894. And back in England, I know I keep on going Germany, England, um, there was a man named Oliver Lodge and he wanted to give a memorial lecture. And so, but he had a problem. He couldn't go in a dark room with his eyes adjusting to a tiny, tiny little spark. He wanted to give it in a lecture hall so people could see what was going on. So the, there's nothing wrong with the transmitter. The problem was with the receiver. So he needed one that was good for a large room and he heard there was something that was eventually called a coherer. If you had little pieces of metal in a little tube and a radio wave went through the tube, the little metal would cohere, stick together, and the electricity could flow through it. So this is what he used to give his demonstration. He had a transmitter on one side, he had an antenna, he had the coherer, which is just a little piece of metal, a battery, and what was called a mirror galvometer. Galvometer just meant that when current went through it, it turned. And then he had a little beam of light hit that. And then if the mirror was turned, the reflected light would also turn. And so this way, when the um, receiver received a, a radio signal, it would make this cohere, and then the electricity would flow through this turn the mirror galvometer, galvometer, and the whole room could see something was moved without touching it. And this was probably, I mean, I'm, I can't remember exactly how far it went. It was just the length of the room. But it was different because it showed how you could do this um, on a grand scale instead of with um, staring at it with, you know, with your eyes adjusting. And the paper about this went out and it was an inspiration to many people, but I'm gonna talk about two people who were inspired by it. The first one was a 20 year old man named Guillermo, I always say that wrong, Marconi, who was living in Italy, but was Italian and Scottish. And the other person is a 35 year old man named Jagadish Chandra Bose. And I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. So I'm gonna start with Marconi. When he read Lodge, he was just like, this is it. I'm going to make a living sending wireless signals really far distance. And he became obsessed with it. And he basically did it through trial and error. He learned that if he put one end of the wire in the ground, it worked a little better. If he went on the hill, it worked better. If he had the antenna higher, he, everything was trial and error. But he got it longer and longer distance but he realized he would only make money with a wireless empire if he could get the signal across the ocean, because otherwise you would just use the wires that were there. There was no point to it. So he had a transmitter that he borrow basically borrowed from Nikola Tesla and a coherer basically borrowed from Jagadish Chandra Bose. And he tried to get his signal across the Atlantic. 
but he had a problem and it was physics. His problem was the earth is curved. So if you send a signal out every direction, eventually you shouldn't be able to receive it. It should just go straight off the earth. And Marconi solved this problem by ignoring it. He's like, it'll just work. And luckily for him, it did. On December 15th, 1901, he sent a signal across the Atlantic and then his empire was born. And it took many years afterwards, but actually they found out that what happened was there was a layer called the Heaviside layer named after the same guy who discovered the um, different way of writing Maxwell's equations. And there's a layer in the atmosphere and the radio waves bounce off of that. So the radio wave can get farther than you were expecting with just the round earth. But Marconi didn't know anything about that. Actually, Marconi had a long thing that like, because he grounded the wave, the wave was just skimming the earth. It, it was fine, it just wasn't right. And it actually took into the, I think the 1920s till they discovered the Heaviside later. But don't quote me on the 1920s bit. Um, and Marconi, uh, meanwhile, became incredibly wealthy and his company became incredibly powerful. And when that happened, a million other people started their own wireless companies with their own wireless devices. And I'll come back to that. I want to talk a little bit about Jagadish Chandra Bose. So Jagadish had actually, he was born in India, but he went to England to be a doctor, but then it, it was too disgusting and smelled too bad. So he instead studied science and he went back to India when he read the paper by Oliver Lodge. And he was inspired not to make a wireless empire, but to study more of what Hertz has done, use radio waves to um, study the nature of light and the nature of electromagnetic waves. So he, no interest in money, only theory. And I know that that's easy to say, but luckily we have a letter from him where he wrote to a friend when he was in England, he went back to England for a bit, and he wrote, my friend, I wish you could see that terrible attachment for gain in this country, i.e. England, that lust for money and more money. Once caught in that trap, there would be no way out for me. So what he wanted to do was make the radio waves smaller and smaller and smaller. And small radio wavelengths are called microwaves. So he was interested in making really small waves so he could more accurately study their electromagnetic properties. It's a normal radio waves are like a meter long. He wanted to get more, I think he got to like six, five millimeter. I'm gonna go with five millimeter. I might be wrong. Sometimes I have too much numbers in my head. And he became the pioneer of microwave radio. According to a man who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1977, he said that Bose was 60 years ahead of his time. But Bose also did a couple other things. First, he was trying to do the coherers, but because of the warm and damp climate of Bengal, which he was living in, he caused special difficulties. The coherer wouldn't work that well when it was really humid. So he starts looking into all sorts of materials, which is why he made a better coherer that um, Marconi used on that one experiment. And, but by September, 1901, he found a coherer that worked with something called Galena. And he, he was actually convinced to make one patent and then he let it go because he just didn't care. And then 1901, he said, in a coherer or detector of electrical disturbances or Hertzian waves, i.e. radio waves, galana is a sensitive substance. This was the galana, which I might be mispronouncing, is a semiconductor. This was the first instance of semiconductors in radio and radio detectors. Now, the next year, a man named Greenleaf Pickard, which is a fabulous name, he found he was really inspired and he found multiple substances would work, including silicon. And in 1906, he patented what was generally called a cat whisker. And what this, it was called a cat whisker because you can see there's a little piece of metal and in here there's galena. 
And this worked as a one-way valve, or what's now called a one-way diode or diode. And um, but nobody knew how this worked. And um, and this was sold as well as thousands of other kinds of detectors. There was a real battle of the detectors because people knew the condenser didn't work very well, but they didn't know what would work very well. And the problem with this cat whisker is it worked great unless you were at the wrong spot. So if it jiggled, you suddenly couldn't get the signal anymore. And then you'd have to carefully put it in the new spot. Okay, so there's a race for better detector. Um, there is a Canadian named Reginald Fesedin, and he made a detector with chemicals. And this made um, Marconi very nervous because the detector with chemicals actually worked really well, and he didn't have a patent for it. So he's quite worried about getting outsourced. And luckily, in 19, well, in 1904, Marconi had an assistant named John Fleming, who had previously worked for Edison and knew that there was a, a lamp with a, a light bulb with a little metal in it that worked as a one-way valve. And as Fleming recalled, he had a sudden very happy thought, why not try the lamps? So he tried the Edison lamps to detect, that was Fleming, to detect radio. And it worked, it worked great, except it was expensive. And it didn't seem like it was that much, that useful for that much money. But these were called Fleming valves or diodes for die for two odes for path. And if you look at it, it looks like it has three paths, right? But what it had was one input and two outputs. So because it had two outputs, it was called a diode and now, all one-way electric valves are called diodes, like LED are light emitting diodes. Because if you put in the LED the wrong way, it won't work. <laughs> it only works one way because it has a semiconductor diode in it. Anyway, um, now I go to a man named Lee DeForest. And in December, 1905, he filed for patent using an electric valve, which has been fully described by Fleming. And then a few months later, he says, you know what, I'm gonna pretend I invented that. So that's what he did. He invented a valve and it's almost identical. I mean, this, oop, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna get it. Uh, we're gonna get it, hold on. Sorry, I just wanted to show the picture. So this is the Fleming valve. It has a plate and it has a wire. And I go into the details in, a bit in one of my videos about it, but it is, disturbingly similar. There's a plate, there's a coil, it uses a one-way valve. It's the exact same thing. It's almost the exact same thing, except Fleming was kind of deaf, so he used the galvanometer, and DeForest wasn't, so he used headphones. <laughs> but they're very similar other than that. So immediately after that, of course, he was sued. And after being sued, he's like, in a panic, basically starts adding wires everywhere to these tubes. He was, winds it around, he puts a coil, he puts a co coil in the middle, he puts two wires on the outside, he puts plates on either side. I mean, this, isn't, this is just some of them. I think it was counted 17 different ones. But his best one, he called an audion. We most people called a triode. Triode because it had, this time, it had three different paths to come from. And it had its um, main light bulb, a uh, filament, sorry, it had the plate and in between the plate and the filament, it had this little grating. And he basically used it like they used the diode. He didn't use it very well. But a few years later, there was a 19 year old named Howard Armstrong. And he was in college and his professor had a triode and he tried adding a capacitor, which is uh, something that stores charge. And he was hiking one day and he says, whenever there's high frequency, you gotta tune it. So he added a coil that was tunable and suddenly the signal was like a hundred times higher. He like went into his sister's room and said, woke her up in the middle of the night and was like, I did it, I did it, I did it. And within a day he was in Yonkers, which is in near New York. 
or in New York State. And he could hear from Hawaii. He could hear from all the way, just from his house with a little wire because because he figured out positive feedback. And now I'm going to, after World War I, Marconi's international company was split up and the American version was called RCA, Radio Company of America. And by 1924, RCA, with many of the ideas of Howard Armstrong, not just positive feedback, but few others, revealed a new radiola and the radio craze began. Suddenly, everyone was playing with wireless radio and everyone wanted one of these. And this is a picture of Howard Armstrong showing it off at the beach because it was portable, but I think it weighed like 50 pounds. So I'm not sure how portable. And this is a, a actress showing off how attractive it is. And this is an advertisement saying how great it is. And soon every professional you triode and the only people left using the um, cat's whiskers were like amateur kids making up their own wireless set in the backyard. And now I'm gonna fast forward, oops, sorry. Fast forward to January, 1935. And an Englishman named Robert Watson Watt. Watts was asked if radio could be used as a death ray. Like, could you send a radio signal and make a plane explode? And he's like, I don't know. So he asked his assistant. He said, hey, can we use radio to make a plane explode? And this assistant said, no, you can't do it. The worst thing that'll happen is the radio signal will hit the plane and bounce right back at you. And Robert Watson Watts said, brilliant. Why don't we use that? We don't use it as a death ray. We'll use radio as a way to see airplanes far away. So instead of it, we'll use it to detect airplanes. And they called it, eventually, radio detective detection and ranging, i.e. radar. And all it was, and by February of 1935, same year, they used radar to detect a plane. They actually used the BBC tower, sending a signal. And then um, the only thing Robert Watson Watt did was sneak in beforehand and add an extra piece of metal on the plane just to make sure it worked. But anyway, he became known as the savior of Britain because lots of people felt that, um, having radar help them in the Battle of Britain. And I have this little story about this. I just can't, I have to tell you. Okay, so how many of you have heard that um, carrots are good for your eyesight? I was always taught carrots are good for your eyesight. The carrots are very healthy. But you're, I was specifically told to eat my carrots because carrots are good for your eyesight. Turns out that was made up in 1940 because they didn't want the Germans to know that they had radar. So they started publishing these series of articles that their sharpshooters had extra great vision because they ate a lot of carrots, because they knew the Germans liked carrots as a healthy thing. And then after the war was over, they just like, well, there's no point in telling people. And the, all the people in Britain started planting carrots. They're like, I'm gonna get better eyesight too. People in Germany started, and then they just figured, you know, let's just keep everyone eating carrots. And you should eat carrots, they're healthy. But they don't really affect your eyesight whatsoever, which I just find that amazing. Anyway, so they had radar. And once they had radar, suddenly, after what is this now, 40 years later, after Jagadish Bose, there was suddenly an interest in microwaves. Because if you have a big wave, you can only see big things. If you have a smaller wave, you can see smaller things. And if you have a smaller wave uh, transmitter, you can put it in your small airplane. So there was more interest in smaller waves. Smaller waves is higher frequency and it's called microwaves. And the problem is vacuum tubes don't work at high frequency. So there was a guy at Bell Labs who looks very unpleasant in this picture, but I have no idea, it's the only picture I could find of him, named George Southworth. And he was like, hmm, maybe we could go back to that old cat's whiskers he used in World War I. And he actually looked around, he couldn't find it. He had to go to a used radio store and see if they have any old radios in their back 
And they did, and they had an old crystal set. These were called crystal sets. And he got out an old cat's whisker and tried it with high frequency. And now this cat whisker is called a point contact diode. And like I said, it was inspired by Bose. So he found that it worked. And so he went to his coworker, whose name was Russell Schumacher Ohl, and I just love this name, but he went by RSO, who studied every semiconductor and decided that silicon worked the best. So Ohl started growing crystals. He grew them like you grow crystal sets. You ever got those crystal things as a kid? You know, you get the crystal and you mix the thing and you let it grow. And he did it like that, but he made it very, very pure. And he found that some were positive, and he called that the P-type, and some were negative, and he called that the N-type. Then, one day in 1940, there is a piece with a crack in it, and it was very strange. And according to him, he had to see, quote, what the Dickens was the matter with it. And he found if he shined light on it, it would conduct electricity. And this is called a PN junction diode. It's a P and an N and an anode and cathode. Fun fact, you know who named anode and cathodes? Our friend Faraday, who got to get and decided that everything should have new names. Unfortunately, it's confusing because he said, anyway, the cathode's where the electricity comes from, but he didn't know electrons move the opposite direction. So it gets confusing sometimes. And this is also called a diode, even though it does not have two paths. Um, and actually, by the May of the next year, he filed a patent for the first solar cell. So, but aside from that, it was filed in 1941. It was only given in 1946. Sometimes there's a gap. But for the duration of World War II, they mostly kept this stuff secret. And he actually would hide, I think, the N types and only give the British the P types because he didn't want them to know his secret. And at the end of the war, Bell Labs decided to make, make a project. They said, use these semiconductors and make an amplifier that works like the vacuum tube. And they put a name, man named William Shockley in charge of it. And they hired two people, a man named Jar John Bardeen and another one named Walter Breton. I think I'm saying his name right. Anyway, Shockley had one idea about how to make this work. And Bardeen and Breton had another idea. And, but unfortunately, since Shockley was their leader, they had to do the plan that they didn't like for a long, long time. And eventually they just said, you know what? We're gonna do our own plan. And it turns out their own plan worked. And by December, 1947, they had made an amplifier with, this one was with germanium. And it looks really funky. This is an actual photograph of the thing. And I think it's like, it's like tiny. It's like this big. It's very small um, and very awkward. If you see, like, look at this wire. I don't know what they were doing with that. But anyway, in December 1947, and they decided to call it a transistor. And they were super excited. They give this big presentation. We've developed the first transistor. And the world went crazy. And then their boss pulled them into the office. And according to Breton, Shockley said, sometimes the people who do the work don't get the credit for it. And they're like, what? And he said that he was basically like, I should be at the top of the patent. In fact, I should be the only name on the patent. And they were like, no, you had nothing to do with this. Basically, they said no. And so he was furious with them. He actually hid in a hotel room for a month and ended up designing a sandwich transistor, which is called a sandwich transistor because it's an N with a P in the middle and then another N. And uh, this was actually much more useful to design semiconductor transistors, but he still wasn't enough for him because making the second transistor and a better one wasn't as good as being the first to make a transistor. So if, actually there's this famous photograph where Electronics Magazine came to take their picture. And here comes Shockley. He just pushes his way in there and sits in the front. And you can't really tell, but according to both of them later on, they were interviewed. They just like, this picture just made them so mad. They were furious. And after this, 
um, both of them refused to work with Shockley anymore. I think Bardeen left to be work as a professor, and then he ended up winning. They won. They ended up sharing a Nobel Prize for this work, and then Bardeen ended up winning a second Nobel Prize in semiconductors. So they're very smart people, but none of them worked on uh, transistors. Any, I mean, Bardeen and Breton didn't work on transistors anymore because they wouldn't be in the same room with Shockley. Like. If you read their personal story, like they were interviewed. And when you hear what they say about him, they're like, <laughs> never again. But Shockley, he was like, the problem with working for Bell Labs, and this is true for most companies, if you produce something, the company gets the money from it, not you. He's like, I should be getting the money for it. So in 1956, he quit and moved to his hometown of Palo Alto. And he started something called Shockley Labs. And he attracted the best and the brightest white male scientists. And I say white male scientists because he was proudly racist. Like when he was near death, he was like, my greatest accomplishment is being racist. <sighs> yes, yeah, exactly. But anyway, he was so awful that eight prominent workers who he called the traitorous eight left in 1957 to form a new company that they called Fairchild Semiconductor. And Fairchild's, and he said, oh, they will never amount to anything. You'll fall apart. It turns out Fairchild Semiconductor turned out to be something. The first thing is at Fairchild Semiconductor, one of the treasonous eight, Dr. Robert Noyce of Fairchild Semiconductor invented the first integrated circuit that could be produced commercially. A few months before him, a guy in Texas produced the first integrated circuit, but you had to apply the wires on the outside. This one, you could do it, all of it could be done in the integrated circuit. And then um, people at this company started forming other companies. And pretty soon, uh, sometimes they're called fair children, which I find amusing. Hundreds, literally hundreds of companies are connected to this company and tens of billions of dollars. And um, some of the companies are, for example, Intel and Apple. And once you had these kind of companies, these many hundreds of companies in the area, the area started to be called Silicon Valley. And so, do, this is my last. I'm talking to you today from near Silicon Valley because of a series of events that began in 1820, when a Danish scientist named Hans Orsted discovered that current carrying wires create a magnetic force. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you. That was fantastic. Well, thanks. Uh, brilliant story, uh, starting from uh, somewhere in Europe, uh, uh, traveling across, uh, I guess, uh, from Denmark to, uh, a lot of Germans, some Italians, <laughs> yes. uh, and some Englishmen, uh, I mean, English, Scottish. Uh, yes. Then from there on to, we have one Indian, which is, yes. uh, uh, we are very uh, uh, grateful to you for bringing him into the story. Now, I will ask, you know, I have uh, quite a few questions that uh, the uh, YouTube viewers have asked. Uh, mm -hmm. But let me start with the question that, you know, in, uh, again, everywhere, uh, science is uh, taught without uh, the historical grounding, but also with a lot of uh, mistakes and errors and uh, um, you know, uh, wantonly. So let's take this uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose and uh, Marconi. Mm -hmm. so we have seen in some of our textbook versions that it was Jagdish Chandra Bose who discovered radio, which uh, isn't true, but that's what we hear. But equally, we also see the problems between uh, Tesla and uh, Marconi and uh, lawsuits flying all over the place. So mm -hmm. who do you think actually, uh, uh, if you could give this an invention that is, that is commercializable, who mm. did the, the, the best radio equivalent? Oh, see that? I don't know. I mean, if the question is who did the best job with the commercialization, then there's no question. It was Marconi. Okay. Marconi was all about commercialization. 
and he wasn't going to let anything. If you were going to say who invented using radio for communication, arguably Lodge just because, I mean, but not for that reason. Mm -hmm. He was only doing it long distance to show to a crowd. He wasn't interested in long distance communication. Um, and then Tesla was, uh, he read about, he, he wasn't influenced at first by Lodge. He read about Hertz's experiment at the Parisian fair and became obsessed. And that's what inspired him to make the Tesla coil. But then he was like, okay, we're going to use this to electrify the whole earth. The whole earth is going to vibrate with electricity. Mm. And then I'm going to make a big tower and it's going to have big things in it. And then you can put your light bulb in anything and it'll glow. And it's not, it's not good physics, but at the time, nobody knew what was going on. Nobody knew what was good physics or bad physics. It wasn't good physics, but it was dramatically beautiful and inspiring engineering. And that's why at first Tesla couldn't care less. The Marconi was using it for this low class, sending a signal and it didn't matter to him at all. And I feel like Bose's influence is much more important in terms of semiconductors and in terms of microwave radio. I mean, I didn't talk much about microwaves, but in terms of microwave science, he was so far advanced of anyone. Mm -hmm. And many people either reinvented it, what he invented 60 years before or 50 years before, depending on what you're talking about, or they just found his stuff because he basically never patented and patented anything. And, um, you know, he came up with wave guides and all this stuff. So he should be known as the father of microwave radio, um, microwave, um, sorry, technology. And he should be known as the sort of the grandfather of semiconductors and transistors and modern solid state physics. But I feel like his influence on the um, long distance uh, wireless telecommunication was kind of minor because Marconi would have gotten the receivers from someone else, if that makes any sense. And I don't think he was interested in commercialization. He was pretty clearly not, if that makes sense too. Uh, may also, uh, you know, let me, let me ask a, a question, which is uh, to me uh, more interesting. How did you get interested in the, the history of science? Uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you started with the quote. Uh, like how you learned about Orsted and uh, electricity. Right. When did you start really, um, uh, you know, digging into the history? I think it started, I was teaching a high school physics class and we had this video called Einstein's Big Idea. And it involved actors pretending to be, and there was a part that was said E is for energy and an actor pretending to be Faraday being really sad because he was working at a bookbinder's apprentice. And then he hears about um, Orsted's experiment and then he makes it move and he makes the motor and he's all excited. And then his boss is mad at him, all that story. And I just couldn't believe how he had the same equipment to demonstrate, or very similar, that I had to demonstrate to my students. And I just, fell in love with the idea of knowing not only how things work, but why we think that's how things work. And the more I dug into it, the more I just felt like it, I just loved it. And I, I actually like these people mostly, except for the people I'm disappointed in and dislike. It was really hard to write about this German scientist named Philip Leonard, who became this huge Nazi. Mm. I'm like, because I kind of liked him in the beginning and he's very personable in his words. And then he becomes this like, oh, <laughs> totally <laughs> twisted person. And it was yeah. really painful for me to read this stuff because I'm all the time. I'm like, I met this woman and I love her. And they're like, OK. And they're like, yeah, her name is Hertha Ayrton. OK, she died in 1930. But I just love her. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> I mean, for me. I guess I just love the personal stories. And when I find something which makes these people come alive, the science comes alive with it. 
if that makes any sense. Yeah, wonderful. Sorry, wonderful. that was a long answer. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, what uh, what do you teach? I mean, uh, in schools, uh, uh, what classes were you uh, teaching, or are you teaching now? Uh, um, right now, I'm not teaching. I'm just working. I I started writing a book, and then it morphed into these videos, and it morphed into five books. Okay. <laughs> and I haven't finished any of them, and and it's it's bad. Um, I'm having a little trouble. Um, editing it because I keep on going off into new things. I have one on electricity, one on radio, one on um, uh, quantum mechanics, one okay. on spectroscopy using sunlight to study the stars, okay. and, and I want to write one on Hertha Ayrton. So yeah, um, but uh, I used to teach, I taught a bit of college. I've taught like basic physics class in college. I've taught some math in college. Um, I did more high school teaching and I've taught algebra, which is not as much fun for me. Um, and I've taught basic physics and uh, what's called AP physics, which uh -huh. in the US is like college level, but it's mostly also teaching to the test. Like there's a test at the end of the year. So mm -hmm. I also thought that part of my job was teaching people how to take a physics test, okay. which is a different thing than how do you understand it? How do you learn it? But it's an important right. skill to have because if you yeah. can't figure out how to take a test, then you can't get to the next level of being right. able to do what you want to do. Right, right. Something that we are very used to in India. There's, there's more focus, unfortunately, on uh, writing exams and cracking some of the uh, high-end exams like this JE, the, the one for uh, IITs, etc. But uh, the reason why I asked the question was, no, you have you have taught in colleges, uh, mm -hmm. but teaching in school. I mean, most of your uh, you know your videos in your uh, YouTube channel, and the passion with which you are uh, you know you just gave this lecture. I wanted to understand that, uh, whether this is how you teach in classrooms for school students, and you know demonstration examples and what kind of uh, feedback or reaction you are getting from the students. So I wanted to understand a uh, little bit of your personal teaching. Um, experience uh, you know whether that had any impact on your uh, channel i understand book writing is very different but uh, but to run a, 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 you know a youtube channel and to put together video explanatory uh, video which includes a lot of science and a lot of history a lot of passion uh, i just wanted to know how your uh, students found you in uh, school and college well, I, I, I feel like it's kind of tragic because okay. I would include a few tidbits about science, okay. about the history. Okay. But I never, what started me on this path was I had my second child and um, I took some time off. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I decided to um, try to write this book about the history of science. Mm -hmm. And it was only in those last four years. That's my cat going crazy, by the way, if you're hearing a weird <laughs> sound. No, we, we, um, saw, we saw your cat entering the room. Uh, from the ah, outside. yes. Well, they, they've back. always had to make yeah. their impression. Anyway, so I feel like it's almost a tragedy. I mean, I've, I always have excitement. I have too much excitement. I always have energy. And I love physics, which you can obviously tell. And that was definitely a part of it. But I feel like it was tragic that I didn't include all the history. And I feel like the history is so engaging and mm -hmm. gives you such a deeper understanding of the physics mm -hmm. that I wish I could go back and say, yeah, I mean, I basically said in 1820, Danish scientist Hans Christian Orsted accidentally discovered the current Karen Y effect of circular magnetic force. That's exactly what I said. And that's not true or interesting. Right. And right. so I feel like, when I get back to teaching, which I will eventually, I just because I love it too much, um, I will bring I will come back to it a different teacher with this background, right. and I'm hoping I can influence other teachers to include more context to it mm -hmm. because it's so you know you can't remember something unless you have a connection to it. Very true. Very true. No, I mean, uh, I'm really glad that you are writing these uh, books. I suppose these are meant to be popular science books. Yes. But if you could 
write them as textbooks and mm-hmm. not leave the uh, these as you know fun facts interesting facts little tidbits but sort of welding the popular science book into uh, a textbook mm. which is a challenge i mean i don't even uh, i can't even visualize how such a book can be written for let's say mechanics of uh, celestial mechanics or quantum mechanics you know we we read these popular science books which are fantastic they just bring out the personalities the challenges mm-hmm. the trials tribulations and then there is a parallel stream that is going off mathematics the moment you introduce an equation now we we saw maxwell's equations and the simplification the so called simplification of just the okay. four you know with the divergence and the curls you know which which is very really, really difficult i mean to to really get to the level of understanding uh, that level of physics you need a very strong mathematics right mm-hmm. and understanding the field it's a challenge how do you bring all of this the the little bit of frivolity if you could call uh, the history though it is not and to the right. extremely serious stuff how do you write a book like that I honestly I think it would be easier than a dry textbook. I think Good. it would have more depth and more interest. I mean, I've never written a textbook. Mm-hmm. So, um I actually when I started writing this, I was told, "Oh, you should write this for middle school students because, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. the, the younger ages is when we're mm-hmm. off. I mean, my children I, I can easily buy a book for 6-year-olds mm-hmm. about Faraday. and it will have lots of personal stories. Right. But then you get to the textbook level and they just drop it all out. I have a theory that that started in the 1950s, at least in the United States, mm. with the rush to get to the moon and get to space. Right. There's this right. idea if you want to learn science, and I think that's happening in India too. If you want to learn science, you got to be cut out that arts and history right. nonsense right. Right. and just right. focus on the real thing. Yeah. But the real thing is the history the history makes the science better and you can include the real math with the history for example i did one on um the history of the first um um law of thermodynamics mm-hmm. which is energy mm-hmm. is conserved right and it included why we think kinetic energy is 1/2 mv squared mm-hmm. like where that 1/2 came from mm-hmm. and i realized i'd never really i just Oh, they told me enough that it was one half that I just copied it down and I spit it out and it just never thought like where did this come from what does this mean and uh, for me that it made it easier to remember and more important and easier to manipulate and use um so I think textbooks should have that mm. I I I'm I my video my book so far books <laughs> is um has has real science but i don't go into like how to do the problems or or problem yeah. sets in the back I, yeah but i i would think that that wouldn't be that hard to do i think it would make it a better book and a more a deeper book if okay. you see what i mean and okay. the people who read it and used it as a textbook mm-hmm. would get farther in science and definitely get farther in research i mean we're researching blind we're researching with no idea about how anyone else discovered anything right yeah. it's always either an accident or just discovered not like they were looking for a way to do this or they were trying to show off for their girlfriend or boyfriend or they were looking for a way to connect the universe i think that would be an, an easier book to write than and maybe i'll make my radio one a real one yeah <laughs> Yeah. Oh no, now it's going to take me longer to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, it's it's really bold to simultaneously try writing five books. Uh, maybe you know you should have sort of sequence them, you know, get one out and then the second one out and the third one. Yes, out. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there are a couple few questions that I wanted to pose from the uh, audience. So uh, Sundar Raman was asking how did you get all, you know where, first is how did you get all this information? but mm-hmm. how does one find all this information the historical information let's say about that what is, a did what b did what c did where, where is it available well um now this sounds funny but mm-hmm. i start on wikipedia mm-hmm. cuz wikipedia always has links 
Right. And that gives me a general idea, mm -hmm. although it tends to skip people of color and it tends to skip women. So I'm always careful that like, this is one version of reality. But I use that as to help me get sort of an overview. Oh, why did, you know, and then I try to look for the original things. Because what's amazing about the internet is all of this research I did from my home computer. Right. And right. I, I barely went to the library. And right. like, I can, you can look up and you can read, um, like, you can read what Benjamin Franklin wrote about electricity. You can read all his letters. Right. Um, you can, if you're interested in something, you can read like J.J. Thompson when he won the Nobel Prize for discovering the electron. He gave one of the best Nobel Prize speeches ever. It's so clear. It's so interesting. It's so amazing. And sometimes people will write their own book. But unfortunately, I feel like it's, it's hard hard to uh, find it done for you very well. I mean, there's some books, but I feel like the history of physics books tends to skimp on the physics in a dis disturbing way to me. Like, uh, I don't know, I was reading a book about Faraday and they didn't seem to mention the physics. And I'm like, how can you not mention the physics about a physicist? Like what their work is, is right. very important. Right. Um, and I also, before I started this, believed that all nonfiction books were true. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that, no, you have to do a little bit. Unfortunately, you have to do a little bit more work. Uh, you have to look for, but their patents are online. They're like note letters to each other because people used to write each other letters and right. save them. Le Hertz, his wife published his diary. I mean, you can read all of this stuff and most of it on the internet. So I would start with something that you like and see if you can find what they said about it, what they originally said about it. Hmm. And that, that gives you a much better picture of what's going on than a biography, unless I wrote it, in which case it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the key yeah, is that for a reader, how do you find that something may not be right? So mm -hmm. that's a discriminatory, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the skill to figure out. I mean, at least doubt, at least question. It's not that you have to accept everything, but does it sound right? Uh, you know, has anybody else talked about this? Is there another side to the story? I mean, are you only going to listen to Marconi's side of the story or are we also going to listen to Tesla's side? and both aside and then synthesize and come up with, uh, uh, you know, oh, this is what is most likely has happened and uh, they all see it in their own ways, right? That's on the uh, non-scientific part of it. When it comes to science, uh, you know, today there is, you know, you are, you are doing a lot of videos on YouTube, but equally we see a lot of fake, uh, you know, stories put together just because there is there is there is a commercial element right the more mm -hmm. views there are the more money one can make i mean we we are quite aware of it because uh, you know we we also do a lot of uh, culture heritage and art architecture and indology related uh, content and we see a lot of people just making up you know go to a real place take video of it but then spin a completely nonsensical story around it and those are the videos that are watched a uh, million times Right? Now, I know. You, you can take, you know, Edison versus Tesla and then make up a complete non existent. Oh, fight. that's one of the worst. <laughs> yes. And you will see millions of page views. And here you put a lot of research together, look through and give, uh, you know, a nice history of 200 years of, uh, uh, you know, electricity, magnetism, electromagnetic waves, light to, uh, uh, you know, radio waves, semiconductor, uh, to, uh, you know, integrated circuit, the entire story. And you wouldn't really see that many number of people coming. So we, somewhere in the schools, we have to first tell, I mean, teach our students you know, how to quickly figure out what is good and what is nonsense. Right. right. I think that I agree with you. It is frustrating, but it's probably in every field. Yeah. The sort of sensational fake things right, right. get so much attention that it, 
And once you hear it enough, you're like, oh, yeah, Tesla invented electricity, of course, because I know that, because I heard it. Yeah. And it's like, well, no. And they were like, but, and um, it is so hard to cut through that. Right. But I think right. some of it is the the fundamental laws. So, yeah. for example, um, the laws of thermodynamics. I have a great story about this. Okay. So my husband loves watching YouTube videos that are not mine, uh, that are about, like, newest inventions. <laughs> and he said, oh, I found this great video. There's this engine, and it works with, you know, 100% efficiency. Yeah. And I'm like, no, Mike... No. You can't win, you can't break even, and you can't get out of the game. And he's like, what? And I said, oh, those are the laws of thermodynamics. I don't know if you guys were taught this. This is a trick to remember the laws of thermodynamics. You can't win, meaning you can't get more energy out of it than you think you can, mm -hmm. than you start with. You can't break even, meaning you always lose something to entropy in right. an engine. Right. And you can't get out of the game, meaning you can't hit absolute zero, the third law of thermodynamics. And the crazy thing was, he said, like the whiz, and I said, what? And he said, The Wiz. There's a musical, a black version of The Wizard of Oz called The uh -huh. Wiz uh -huh. with Michael Jackson. Uh -huh. And Michael Jackson plays the scarecrow and he sings, you can't win, you can't break even, and you can't get out of the game. <laughs> okay. I'm like, no way. <laughs> but I had to look into how the laws of thermodynamics uh, ended yeah. up on a musical, mm. which that's, is two laws yeah, I have. That's, that's a wonderful story. I mean, I hadn't uh, heard of this. Uh, but this, you know, this idea of a perpetual motion machine is mm -hmm. something that uh, to this day, we find every once in a while in our newspapers, I'm talking about India, in, in particularly my province, Tamil Nadu, we see, uh, you know, a starry eyed little uh, kid uh, with uh, some device and the, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the journalist has actually written a story of how somebody has found this device which could produce you know, energy out of water and uh, a cycle that can keep running forever. I, I, I'm just so, uh, you know, uh, uh, disappointed with that thing. You know, come on, guys, learn a little bit of science before writing about science. Right? Yes. So, but yeah. that's why, like the, some of the laws of thermodynamics will save you. Mm. If you, that's why you can, someone says, you know, we found the way to use the pyramids to connect to the, resonance of the earth and we're going to make every and you're like okay you can't win you can't break even you can't get out of the game right. and in order to make and because it goes with the tune which i'm not going to sing for you because i like you and i'm not a good singer but if you are a good singer you can sing it it has a nice tune and um but the whole idea of like getting some of these basic kernels of like you can't go faster than the speed of light and you can't violate the laws of thermodynamics. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, it sort of helps you distinguish the garbage from the real. And I think part of it is that science is so magical. Yeah. And I mean this in the word. I mean, every time something is discovered, it is so magical. It is so amazing that it is so easy to fall down paths where things that are totally fake seem so real because the real things seem sort of fake, right? Quantum yeah. entanglement, that is freaking weird. And that is magical. Right. And Einstein would still be mad that it works. And, <laughs> so. But it's, it, that part is real, but the, you know, the perpetual motion machine is not. To, I right. think to lay people, it right. seems, they all seem fantastical. So right. they're all believable. So I think as science teachers, we need to, put down some boundaries yeah. of like, okay, these are sort of what we think are the hard and fast rules. And if something right. violates the hard and fast rule, it better be more than a YouTube video. Right. Yeah. I, I know it is, uh, it, it's quite late uh, for you. Uh, it's okay if I ask one question, one last question. Oh, I, I love talking, so I'm good. <laughs> no, uh, specifically, you know, in a uh, couple of uh, uh, places as you were uh, narrating and presenting, uh, it was very clear that, you know, you were quite um, sensitive to the lack of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, you, once you talked about, um, you know, Shockley and then, uh, you know, when you talked about Leonard, so the diversity in uh, science and, uh, 
you know, a lack of women in science, um, uh, you know, multiple uh, ethnic groups, disadvantage. Uh, do you see that actually internet, which you, you talked about internet as a, a place of doing research, sitting at home and you have almost all the primary material, in fact, accessible to you, not just the secondary written uh, books or, you know, we, we look at Wikipedia at a certain level, but you, know, you have access to real solid primary material. Will this, in your opinion, change this, um, the, uh, you know, the diversity factor? Will it bring more, uh, uh, you know, uh, kids, more, more girls studying science, more, uh, you know, communities like blacks in US and in India, again, there are lots of disadvantaged communities getting into science seriously? I think that by studying the history, it's become clear to me that every scientist, no matter how advantaged or disadvantaged, is ridiculously lucky mm. to have discovered something. But not only to discover something, they have to be in a position to be able to discover something, to be able to understand it in a new way, to be able to publish it, and then to be listened to. Every single person that I've talked about is a lottery winner. Mm. And I feel like be, the more you realize how rare it is to discover something new and to how, and then when you read the story, uh, read about the stories and you think about the stories of the disadvantaged people, there's, um, there is an American scientist named um, Joseph Henry. And he, he actually was, pretty disadvantaged for a white man. Like he pretty poor, he dropped out of school. He was going to become an actor and then he got sick one day and he read this book and he's like, I got to do science. He go, gets a scholarship to go to a high school. He ends up teaching at the high school. And then he reads about the electromagnets and makes the world's biggest electromagnets. And then he starts making um, basically telegraphs, a long distance communication with it. And he gets a job at Princeton, despite the fact that he hadn't have a college degree. Right. And he gets an assistant who is a freed African American who must, this must have been, this was before the Civil War. So people in the South were slaves. Mm. And he gets this assistant and we know that he says, like, he writes a friend, well, I can't do any work because my assistant is sick. Wait till he feels better or whatever. So we don't, we know he did something but we right. don't know how much he did. And I also know that the amount of money it would take for him to have filed for a patent was almost double his yearly income. Right. So like, there's no way this man would have produced something, but to learn how rare it was for anyone, anyone to produce things, but also how rare it was, learning those little stories, I feel like, at least, I mean, I cannot talk about being a person of color, but I can only talk about being a woman in science, mm -hmm. which has different advantages and disadvantages of being a person of color in science or being a poor person in science or being from whatever country you are. I mean, all these things have an influence. And depending on what time, I mean, there was a time when no one listened to Americans. And then there was a time when everyone listened to Americans. So sometimes it's advantage or disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But I feel like it's not the you. I don't think the YouTube and all that will help so much mm. unless the person is. Um, but I do think knowing the successes and the failures of different people, especially people who are not usually talked about mm. and gay people and trans people. And like there's these stories out there and knowing not just when they did well, but when they didn't do well, when things right. didn't work out for them, right. I think is very energizing. It makes you feel like you're not alone and makes you feel like, okay, there's a reason that I'm not seeing myself represented in the past. And it's not because I'm inferior, it's because I was treated inferior. <laughs> and that I think is inspiring to me, at least as a white woman, it's inspiring me to see these stories and hear these stories and go, okay, these are how these people had a few were allowed to break it. Mm -hmm. And these are how these people did not. Right. And I don't know. I mean, some people think like the history 
since it's so white male centered, is disenfranchising the people. But I find it so inspiring and so, I'm trying to think of the right word. It makes me feel like a part of a, a story. Right, right. And Wonderful. so I, I feel like that's inspiring for everyone. Wonderful. Uh, it, you know, it was uh, truly uh, inspirational, your uh, entire presentation, the, the discussion subsequently. Um, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, we from uh, Varahamira Science Forum, we're really thankful that you could uh, spend uh, this time uh, despite your late hours there. Gopu, you want to add anything uh, with that we can probably conclude? Um, not much. Uh, I also thank her. Uh, we had a, a very good lecture. I think a good sweeping history of uh, uh, you know good connection from uh, Orsted to Silicon Valley. Um, I think it, this is you know uh, it's like the Faraday lectures. You know, one of the things we know he was one of the big popularizers of science. Right. And, you know, comes from a person who could uh, not only understood science. Faraday is very interesting. He didn't do any math. He, the reason Maxwell did so much, you know, for his, uh, some of his electromagnetic stuff is because Faraday almost avoided all maths. And Edison actually mentions that. He says, I love reading Faraday and he doesn't do any maths. And Edison <laughs> also, you know, didn't go to college or school or something like that. He was a tinkerer. And I think... Uh, one thing that we missed out, uh, you know, one thing that we got a lot of was, you know, how many different things, you know, they expected something, uh, they found, you know, they actually did an experiment, they found something else. For example, people thought it was animal electricity, and then they said, no, 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 that's not what it is, you know. Uh, known wisdom gets overturned every 10, 20 years, you know. The scientific, so called scientific truth gets upset every 20 years because some new experiment comes along and, uh, uh, you know, overturns that. Um, and that's, I think she covered a lot of that, uh, but, uh, I, I think, you know, you saw, you saw from some of the comments that people were understanding, there are a lot of things that they didn't know about science uh, that they enjoyed. I would recommend those who haven't seen Kathy's, uh, videos to go see, see those videos, you know, she covers, uh, you know, a lot of history before this and a lot of history after this and various aspects. Uh, so thank you, Kathy. Uh, we hope to perhaps we can make this an annual feature. We can give another lecture next year also. Uh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Maybe I'll do a whole different subject. Yes. We won't talk yes. about the same people though. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you thank so thank you. much for inviting me. I had so much fun. It's. I mean, I love making my videos. I love writing my books. But it's been a very individual experience. It's a me, myself, and I. If someone says, oh, you know, you're filmmaking or you're editing or you're um, like scripting or you're acting or you're I'm like, yep, that that was me. The bad sound editing, that's me. The whole thing is me. So um, it's been so much fun to be able to talk to some people and have a dialogue. It's been it's been a true joy. And